Benot, thank you so much for ga joining Game On Magazine. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. It's 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 always uh, it's always nice to chat to somebody who holds a world record. L uh, you are a para athlete, so let's start off by discussing what exactly is your disability. Uh, the disability I have is called cerebral palsy, and it affects the right side of my body, so my right arm and my right leg. And were you born with cerebral palsy? Uh, yeah, I was born with cerebral palsy from birth. Uh, not sure exactly what form of cerebral palsy I have, um, but that doesn't doesn't matter to me. Renard, you, you what makes you a very special athlete is that you're not only gifted in one athletic code, but three. How did you get involved in athletics? I uh, got involved in athletics in uh, 2003 uh, at Vistanova Primary School. Um, and it was just one of those days where, you know, we had to attend our physical training or our PT class. And uh, my occupational therapist, Delia too, uh, she said I must pick up a, a discus and a shot put or a javelin and see how far I can throw it. And I picked up the discus and uh, I threw it uh, at the school grounds. And uh, from that day, she realized that I've got a talent for the sport and uh, recommended that I attend uh, some, you know, let's say para, para athletics competitions or disabled sport. And uh, from there, it's just uh, gone from strength to strength. You, you attended a special education school for high school as well. What did you struggle to, to participate in sport and is it difficult to be a para athlete? Uh, initially, going from Vista Nova Junior School um, and then spending one year in, in Vista Nova's high school, uh, I then transferred over to a, a special school or a technical school called the Grendel in Milnerton. Um And that is more of a, let's say, a mainstream school. But um, at the same time, it's there are some learners that have learning disabilities, but it's not as prominent. So in my case, I just saw it as a mainstream school. Um, and then you were in class for one day and in workshop learning a trade the next day. Um, and the athletes there were all able-bodied athletes, and I competed with them and managed to get my SA schools colors twice um, and actually took uh, bronze in the javelin in 2006. It's incredible. It really is incredible. Renard, as a para athlete, are you able to compete against able bodied athletes like uh, Oscar Pistorius did in the 2012 Olympics? Uh, are you allowed to, or is it just that, that you perform better as a para athlete? How does it work? Okay, so how it works is that uh, I am allowed to compete with the able-bodied uh, athletes. Uh, I might not throw as far as what they do. For example, uh, in my javelin, I have a personal best of 50.06, which was in Doha last year. And the able-bodied guys throw 60 meters plus, from anything from 60 meters to 18 meters. So I do compete with them. Um, I, compete, I compete with them for the main reason that because they throw further than me, uh, that it pushes me to throw, uh, or let's say to catch up with them. Although let's say, let's be realistic, we, I'll, I'll probably never uh, reach like 70 meters. Uh, but just that the, the the competition out there for me, I can I can compete with these guys. Um, and if you look at it in a Paralympic sense, um, they only there's only literally a handful of guys. I can count them on one hand how many guys there are that actually can actually throw as far as me. So Paralympic sport is is developing, it's growing, um, but we don't get that much opportunity within South Africa to compete. We only get three opportunities a year, and uh, majority of the time I compete with the able-bodied guys, like I'll be doing uh, in two weeks or, or a week's time at the SA Senior Nationals here in Cape Town. Well, Game One is actually going to be at those SA National Champs. Um, one of our one of our journalists is going down to chat to Akani and Wade Fanikirk. Um, Renard, 
What do you think needs to change in order for para sports to get more, to get a bit more of the spotlight? I know for one thing they can be included in varsity sports. I see at the moment they're not. There, there isn't a section for para athletes. But what do you, as, as I mean, you've been doing this for a long time now. What do you think needs to change in order for the sport to grow? Well, look, there's there's a lot that needs to change, but you know. The one thing that I think is is with utmost importance that needs to change is um, coverage. At the moment, we, we get we get a little bit of coverage through through the NetBank National Championships, but that's very limited. Um, I know that we were on um, Morning Live and the SABC um, Prime News, and then we had a bit of an insert on SuperSport Blitz, but that's about it. Uh, if you look at where Athletics South Africa is at the moment, where they've managed to get Athletics back onto TV, that is that is something that Paralympic sport in South Africa needs to get to. Um, and yes, you know it's difficult for me to um, say that you know we don't deserve it. We do, um, but it's for companies and for for. For people out there to to see what we do, you know, just to see what we do once, and it will change your life forever. And just to get the publicity out there will make com- will let companies realize that listen, this is actually something that we need to get involved in. It's not something we just want to do; we have to do it. All right, game on, viewers! You've uh, you've heard it from the man himself. If you want to get involved. How, actually, how can somebody get involved, you know, in terms of donations and stuff like that? Is there, is there an organization that looks after you guys, that looks after specifically para-athletes, or how does it work? How can we get involved? Okay, so by getting involved, you can go to www.sasapd.org.za. Um, that is the mother body for physically disabled and visually impaired sport in South Africa. So the full name is the South African Sports Association for the Physically Disabled and Visually Impaired. So they are our mother body. They are the ones that um, run everything for us. And we have cla- we have classifiers that will uh, determine your disability level or your, or your class. Um, and then we have sport code conveners. So let's say sport managers that will manage a particular sport um, and then they will run events they will run competitions and then um, through that we, we we will know where and what to to put money towards to or which athletes to send overseas for competitions and you know from there we, we can at least sustain the, the Paralympic spirit, the South African Paralympic movement, and, 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 and make it go from strength to strength. Yeah. Right on, uh, we'll, we'll get back to the finances and stuff like that now. Now, you, uh, are, you throw javelin, you throw discus, and you throw shot put. You've won gold in, I think, all of them. Uh, what is your favorite? Uh, by far, my favorite would be javelin. Uh, it's, it's the most, out of the three events, out of the three disciplines, it is the most demanding and it is the most technical event, um, mainly because you've got, there's so much that goes into it uh, to actually get the javelin out and through what we call the point. Uh, so as long as I can go through the point, your javelin will fly. Um, so by far, it's, it's my favorite I think as a man, uh, it's also quite nice to be able to throw a spear every now and again. Makes you uh, yeah. feel, feel like you're part of the olden days. Reynard, what is your training schedule like? Uh, do you do you train every every day on all three codes, or do you focus more on javelin? How does it work? Okay, so my training schedule is at the moment is specifically focused on javelin uh, until after the Rio 2016 Paralympic Games. Uh, as javelin is my only event in Rio, Here so I've, I've stepped back from discus and uh, shot put for for this couple of months, and uh, we'll focus on on shot put uh, after Rio, so we can, we'll be able to do javelin and shot put at uh, the 2017 
IPCF World Championships in London. And then I um, saw the other day that there's actually an event for me now at the Commonwealth Games, uh, and that's shot put. So we are going full steam for that. And uh, But first and foremost, it's Rio. That, that is the goal. That's the focus. Have you qualified for Rio? Uh, I've qualified comfortably, I can I proudly say. Um, I got back last week or, or a few days ago from the Nedbank National Championships in Bloemfontein. Uh, and I threw a 48-28. Um, and my qualifying, my A qualifying for, for the Javelin for Rio is 35 meters. So I qualified by 13 meters. Um, and the 48-28 also placed me number one in the world. So I'm, I'm at the moment I hold the world lead, and I'm reigning world champion. Oh, that's incredible! Is there in your own heart you will know how far you can push yourself? Is there a chance that you will medal at the Paralympics in Rio? Uh, without a doubt, with every fiber of my being, I know I'll medal. Um, we are going for the for the gold medal, as well as the world record. So the world record's not too far off at the moment. I mean, I've thrown a 50, 50.06 in Doha at the, at the World Championships. And uh, it would have happened in Bloemfontein if it wasn't for all the, the different crosswinds that was coming out of that stadium. But uh, we might just see something, maybe not, maybe, maybe not at uh, SA Seniors. If not, we'll just feel... We'll, Reynolds, you there? We'll keep... Hello? Reynolds, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, we're going to have to restart that. My internet dropped. Okay, so just start from the top. Yeah, can you ask questions? Okay, okay. So I wanted to ask, is there a chance of you able to to medal at, at Rio, and, and you will know how far you can push yourself? Yeah, look, uh, I know with every fiber of my being that I can I, I can and will medal. Um, there is no other color medal that I want besides gold. So, you know, we're going to look at, we set a target at 55 meters, which we know we can reach. Um, and uh, we're also looking at breaking the world record in Rio. We might just give some, uh, give the, the guys a bit of a, a, a insight into breaking that world record. Hopefully at the SA Seniors now in, in a week, um, but if not, we'll just keep it out for 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 Rio de Janeiro. Earlier, before 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 the internet dropped, and you were chatting about. Uh, crosswinds and in Bloemfontein that affected your throw. You've, I mean, you've just said now that you've been to Doha, you've been to London, you've, been, you've pretty much been all over the world. Uh, do, does, do you throw better in certain places, and why is that? Um, as a as a field athlete, you tend to throw better in in at, or at altitude. Um, let's let's just say it's being at altitude as a field athlete has its positives and its negatives. The positives being that when you're at altitude, the the air and the the, the oxygen level is not as great. It's, it's very thin, so it allows the javelin to fly further or the discus or the shot to go further. But on the negative side of things, it affects you, uh, affects your body because there's a lack of oxygen at such a high level, you get tired very quickly. Yeah. So... We'd rather take the, the benefit of throwing at altitude than throwing at sea level. Um, and if you want to throw any major records or, or very important records, you want to do it at altitude. You keep saying that we are setting goals. We want to do this. Who is we? Uh, we are myself, the athlete, my coach, Daniel Damon, uh, my javelin coach. And my my job instructor Andre Smith. You know, being an athlete is not just about yourself. There's a whole lot of people that are behind the scenes. Who have been your who has been your support base from day one? Who has who has who has helped you to get to where you are today? Um, first and foremost would be my parents, my mom, and definitely my dad. Uh, my dad played a major role in 
in my success over the over this 13 years um, to to be where I am, to be the athlete that I am and the person that I am today, if it wasn't for him, I'd probably just be sitting in a cubicle somewhere in an office um, and just working myself away. Um, and it was my dad and, and my mom that were the ones to drive and push me in athletics, even in a period where I didn't like athletics. Uh, they were the ones that pushed me and, and motivated me to get to where I am today. And, you know, my mom is still around, uh, so she supports me all the time. She was with me in Bloemfontein. Uh, but just a couple of days before, Bloom, before I even left for Bloemfontein, uh, my father passed away. So it's, it's been a, a bit of a, a journey since the 9th of March when my dad passed. Um, but, you know, he's, he, he might be, be gone, but spiritually he's still with me. And, yeah. still, and still, uh, I can still remember everything he's taught me in, in my life and, and my, my uh, sporting career. Well, Game On Magazine would like to offer our condolences to you and your mother in this difficult time. And we will be rooting for you to break that goal that, so you can uh, look up to the heavens in Rio and, and thank Dad one last time. Yeah, thank you so much. Reynard, you know, you just said now that, that they've been there for you and if they were if it wasn't for your parents, especially your dad, you'll be stuck in a cubicle. So it's safe to say that you're living your dream. Absolutely. I'm living my dream at one hundred percent. Are you able to make a living? This is an important question because a lot of amateur sports as well as para sports you can't make a living. Are you getting some sort of salary? Are you be able to be self-sufficient or do you have a day job? Um, okay, let's first start with the day job. Um, I actually gave up my job about two years ago, um, or was coming up to two years now. So I worked at a, at a well-established uh, four-star hotel in, in Newlands here in Cape Town, and I worked for them for six years. And when I left them, I was the guest relations officer. So working shifts wasn't really um, the best thing for me as an athlete, uh, trying to be a full-time athlete and work. Um, it just it, it took a, a, a big toll on my body. And one injury after another it was just hitting me. So I stopped, I stopped working at the hotel uh, about closing on two years now. And I've been, I've been very fortunate and honored to be part of or included in SASCOX OPEX program. Now, OPEX is a, a program where they take the elite of the elite and put them on a program to help with their preparations be, uh, towards the, the Rio 2016 Olympics and Paralympics. So we get a grant every month that uh, helps us uh, in our training, and they also contribute to us going overseas and competing. So, you know, without a doubt, if it wasn't for SASCOC and, and all the sponsors uh, at SASCOC and the OPEX program, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to go see the world, compete, and compete to the best in the world. So, without a doubt, you know, a huge thank has to go to SASCOC and the OPEX program. It's good to hear you say that Sasco comes under a lot of fire for misadministration and uh, well, maladministration, and it's good to hear that they they do have their athletes' best interests at heart, and, and they want they we, they want to perform at on a national level across all sports. Sorry, an international level across all sports. Reynard, you know a big thing is that you you are a young man, fairly you're the same age as me, 26 if I'm not correct if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, that's great. What? Who do you look up to? Who has been your number one? Who is somebody that that you've looked at that you've got inspiration from? It doesn't necessarily have to be an athlete in your code, but is there somebody or people that you've looked up to as, as you've been as you grow as an athlete? Uh, definitely, I think I think firstly it's it's my training group, it's the it's the athletes that I train with every single day. Um, if I have to, if I can single out two people, it would be um, my my training partner that I see practically every day, Zandri Bailey, and uh, me and her, we, we throw the same distances, 
So whether it's a training session, it's still a competition. Um, so we try to see, uh, okay, let's say on this t today's training, I'm going to throw further. I'll show you. I'll throw further than you. So she she is she plays a big role in my inspiration, um, and also helps motivate me, uh, especially when I'm feeling a little bit down. Um, and then you've got Jana von Skalkweg. Uh, she she is a, a, a up and coming able bodied athlete, but um, I see quite a quite a lot of myself in her um, as an athlete uh, and the determination. I mean, she uh, threw in the competition before me uh, at the SA Schools Championships, also in Bloemfontein, and she became the first under 15 girl throwing with a 500 gram javelin to break the 50 meter mark. Now that's the first girl in the history of South African athletics as an under 15 to do that. Sure. So. For me, that, that that shows a lot of inspiration, that shows a lot of guts, and that makes me um, want to achieve. It makes me want to perform yeah. and and show them what a Paralympic athlete can do. You know, there, there, there's so many things to like about you. You're a charismatic man. You, you're good in front of the camera. But one thing that has struck me just, just by what you just said is that your heroes – if I can put it that way, are South African. A lot of South African athletes look overseas, and the fact that one, your training partner is is one of is somebody you look up to, and an athlete who is younger than you, um, it's just incredible that that you look up to two guys that are within within your own country. And I think a lot of South African athletes can learn from that. We are we are an incredibly gifted athletic nation across all sports, from cricket to athletics to rugby. We have a lot of gifted athletes, and we need to feed off each other's ability to achieve. Then, then rather than looking overseas to somebody who who, who has been training with, with better infrastructure, with better coaches, I think I think it's great that you look up to guys that are within our own borders. On, on the left hand side of your behind you, on the left hand side of the wall, I see all your medals and um, stuff like that. Uh, there's quite a lot on the wall. You're going to run out of wall space there, but um, yeah. Pretty much gonna run out of wall space. I've even started putting my medals in my cupboard. Sure, we. So, so the, uh, what would you say is your your best memory, your best result? My best result would definitely be the toughest competition of my life, which was the 2015 IPC Athletics World Championships in Doha. Um, at one stage, I was sitting in fourth place and going into the competition as reigning world champion, you got a lot of pressure on you. You got a lot of eyes and a lot of cameras on you. So, so the expectation is there to perform. And I think the pressure initially got to me. But, you know, they say an athlete has to have BMT. Now, my BMT kicked in big time on my last throw, on my on throw number six. And my coach actually prayed for a miracle. And funny enough, one of our friends from Norway came walking down and actually told me to actually aim at a certain, uh, um, they say advertising board that was across from me. And we hit it and we hit it perfectly. And it went 50.06. And that was a personal best for me. That was a South African record. That was an African record. And it was the, the World Championship record, the IPC Athletics World Championship record. So hitting three records and coming back from fourth place for me was the best competition of my life, but also the most difficult. Oh, that's incredible. Just a technical question now. You said that you threw your best throw uh, on throw number six. When they tallying up your scores, is it the best out of six, or do they do they average it out over over the six throws? So what they do is you get so uh, yes you get six throws and they look at the throws individually. So they look at your furthest furthest throw individually. So if throw number three of six is the furthest, they will look at number three. In my case, throw number six was the furthest. So. They, they, they don't generally tend to um, average it out unless you are competing 
in a combined class where distance does not matter anymore and you'll work on points. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm sure I, I now know. So next time I watch athletics, I won't look so dumb. I won't look so dumbstruck when I watch athletics again. Uh, Reinhardt, you just said now that it, it, there was a lot of pressure on you, and, and it goes to the old adage of it's easy to get to the top, it's difficult to stay there. How do you mentally prepare for your competitions? Mentally prepare, it's it's a thing, you know, Saskock have, have provided us with a high-performance advisor or, let's say, high-performance consultant in Professor Frank Dick. Now, we had, a, we had a chat with him, and we were looking at actually getting a psychologist, a sports psychologist, and he said something really fascinating for me is that a sports psychologist, you can get one. You know, it's great, but a sports psychologist will do one of two things. He will either help you and actually make you a better athlete, or two, he'll make you think, and it will actually be bad for you or it will be it will be and not give the benefit that you are wanting so the way i prepare mentally is i chat with my coach i have such a unbelievable relationship with my coach that you know there, there's stuff that i can tell my coach that i don't tell my parents um, and you, it's very very important to have a relationship like that with your coach because you're spending more, practically more time with your coach than you are at home. So, and especially when you go away on tour, if you are away from home for two weeks or three weeks, or if you're an international athlete like Akani Sambini or Wade Fanike, those guys spend four months away from home and they are with their coach. So it's, it's, you get, you get very sad when you're away on tour and the one person that's always there is your coach and he's always listening. He or she's always listening. So having that relationship and knowing that you can speak your mind, that, that plays a major role with with your mental preparation going into a competition. Well, hats off to your coach uh, for being such a pillar of support for you. In closing, Reinhardt, what would you say to aspiring athletes, whether they're able-bodied or not, uh, javelin, discus, and shot put. What would you say to them to get them onto the track and, and to perform? So my, I, I'll start it off like this. My story of being a Paralympic athlete is not glamorous. It's not a, a story where I've lost my leg or anything like that. My story revolves around hard work and dedication. So I battled for 10 years to be seen internationally, to be seen by the international selectors. Now, most athletes, you, you guys tend to give up after two years. I battled for 10 years. So take that as, as motivation, knowing that someone that's gone out 10 years and tried his best every single year to make it internationally. Now, for one, for one I know that any athlete out there, doesn't matter what sporting code or or even if you think your sport is not a sporting code, go out there and just hard work and dedication and you will be seen. You've heard it from the man himself. Reynard, thank you so much for joining Game On Magazine. We will be rooting for you in Rio and we wish you all the best. Thank you so much and thanks for having me. Thank you, Reynard. Bye-bye.